Hi everybody, greetings from a sweltering hot Cape Town. Oh, I don't know what the temperature is outside, but let me tell you, it's a scorcher today. It feels like my clothes are sticking to me. Don't be surprised <laughs> if you see sweat dripping from my brow before this movie is over. Well, today is a special occasion, so happy Valentine's Day to all you lovers out there. And um, for interest sake, let's have uh, something romantic. And uh, what can be more appropriate than uh, turning to the Old Testament? Song of Solomon's, chapter 1. Now, I just <laughs> ask you, th you theologians out there to, uh, to just bear with me if I use a little bit of poetic license. Um, verse 7 of chapter 1. There's a lady talking. And she's, she seems a little troubled because, she, you know, she wants, she wants to meet her boyfriend, but it seems like there's a problem in doing this. And, and she's complaining a little because she finds herself having to hang around his buddies. And she says, you know, this isn't right. I've got to walk around with like a veil on my face. And, and, and you know, your mates are there and, and, I, and I don't see you anywhere. Where, where, where do you go to during the day? Where, where can I find you so that I might be able to see you? She says something like that. Now, verse 8, now he replies, and uh, he says, what you don't know? He said, take your goats and just uh, graze them near the, the tents of the herdsmen. And then he tells her how she must get there. And this is very interesting, bearing in mind that this was written thousands of years ago. He says to her, follow the tracks of my sheep. Follow the tracks. In other words, find the spoor and do a follow-up you'll find me at the end of it and so i thought okay today let's talk a little bit about tracking we've you know touched here and there on it as i have related certain uh, stories about the rhodesian bush war but let's look at it from the point of view of an introduction shall we say um so I, i'm not i'm not going to be complicated about it i'm going to try and keep it very very straightforward this this is for someone who really doesn't know too much about it, but uh, is curious enough to find out how, how did the Rhodesian army uh, work? What were the methods that they employed in tracking insurgents? Now, there are a few things if you wanted to be a tracker that you would have to have. Um, you know, immediately it comes to mind that you've got to have good eyesight. I mean, it doesn't help if you... If you can't see so well, you've got to have the ability to discern the signs that you find in front of you. You've got to be persistent as well. That's got to be part of your makeup and your nature. You don't give up easily and you've got a certain amount of endurance. I mean, you, you can go for hour after hour after hour, single-mindedly focused on, on what you are doing. So you, you've got to have that sort of ability. Uh, and then you must have uh, a, a bit of a competitive spirit. Uh, there are going to be times when you, you realize that you're up against somebody that's perhaps matching his wits against you. And, uh, and you know, you want to get out on top. You want to, you want to be the guy that, that, that wins at the end of the day. And uh, you also must have um, the desire to, to kind of solve mysteries. To unravel what you see unfolding in front of you, to have a bit of imagination and initiative, because there's times you've got to think for yourself. You can't, you can't wait for instructions from other people. So if you if you've got all these abilities, um, or you've got some of them, I mean you can work on the others. Then you've got the makings uh, of a tracker, I think. Preparation. Well, let's pretend for a moment that you're a territorial soldier, such as I was. Um, and that you're a tracker controller. Now, being a territorial, that means that you were, uh, part of your life was spent in the bush and the other part of your life was spent in Civvy Street. But just because you weren't on active service didn't mean you could ignore the, uh, uh, the necessity of preparing yourself for the next call-up. And one of the things that I would do is I would pay careful attention to my, my fitness level. And uh, I would run uh, every morning before work, say five kilometres, and in the evening, when I got home from work, I would uh, set out again and do another five kilometers. And I would do this um, sunshine or rain. It, I tried not to disappoint myself and let myself down on that score. Weekends, I would put in uh, at, at least a, a 20 kilometer walk. 
uh, in the early days, I would ask somebody to drive me out perhaps to Lake Macawain or to Skyline Hotel, drop me off there, and then I would walk back to town. And then I would be keeping my eye on the side of the road and I would be watching for any gravel or sandy uh, spots on the verge and uh, see if I could find any spoor there and then I would, I would just practice tracking. Um, as the war intensified, that kind of thing became a bit dangerous and uh, I had to confine myself to walking between the residential suburbs. But that also gave me a great opportunity for finding tracks and for following them. Uh, it never went very far. I mean, these were usually uh, footprints left by people who were going down to the store or perhaps folk who decided to go and visit their neighbours and instead of driving in their car, they, they walked along. Or it was house servants who were going from one place to the other. But at least it gave one the opportunity to, to practice a bit. And then of course you want to get your kit in order. You can't wait till the last moment before you get called up. Um, sooner is much better than later. So service your kit, make sure nothing's going to fall to pieces when you're in the bush. And uh, talking about kit, <clears throat> I, I said in one of my previous videos that somewhere lying around here yeah, was a pair of uh, uh, Feldskins uh, from the bush war and I, I have uh, uncovered them. <laughs> yeah, they are absolutely genuine authentic uh, from that era and uh, They not in uh, they not in bad condition at all considering everything and um, And even the color is not so bad normally these would turn a sort of a Chocoly color after you have worn them a while in the bush, you know, uh, but but these don't look too bad. Um, incidentally, if you were worried about leaving spur of your own in the bush, then what you would do is you would grind off all these sharp edges. I see I haven't done it with this pair of shoes. Um, and you, you'd actually take it, hold it up against the bench grinder, and you would, you would grind off all this uh, very, very sharp uh, edges over here. And so that when you are finished and you walk, on the on the sand it will leave a sort of a an ill-defined hollow with uh, no uh, sharp definition that the shadows can can make uh, in the track it'll that'll help it stand out so that's something that that one can do and and talking about footwear while we at it um, put them on uh, go outside find somewhere where you can leave some tracks okay and when you've done that study them Make sure you know what your own footprints look like. That's quite important. You know, <clears throat> the ocean is a very big place, but nonetheless, ships still collide into each other. And the bush is a very big place. And you would be surprised that the, it doesn't often happen, but now and then there might be an occasion when you actually crisscross your own spoor. And uh, you're approaching it, of course, from a different direction because you're on a different follow-up. It might be days old, it might be even a bit more than days old. Um, but if it's still there on the ground and you come across it, at least for goodness sake, you can, you can identify your own spur and not go off on a wild goose chase or set somebody else, uh, you know, in that direction while you're still busy doing your follow-up. So get to know your own tracks, okay? It, it really pays off. If you can, get to know that, it, uh, you know, the marks left by your, uh, the guys in your stick as well. That's, that's also quite important in a way, but, but less important, at least if you can identify one set of tracks, you have a reference point. So um, those are some of the things that you can do to prepare yourself before you actually uh, get called up and go off into the bush. Finding Spoor Well, I'm sure you can imagine a great many reasons why a follow-up would be initiated. Um, I must say, from my own experience, there were very few instances uh, that I was ever sent out deliberately to go and look for spoor. Usually there would be uh, some sort of event. The insurgents uh, would have made contact with the military or the civilian uh, members of our population in some form or other. And um, we would then be dispatched to, to react and then to uh, commence a follow-up. And if uh, fortune was on our side and, um, uh, you know, uh, we were successful, uh, then we would eliminate the, uh, the people that were causing the problem. So uh, let's just imagine this for a moment. Uh, perhaps it might be easier to understand it in this sense. 
uh, let's say that a, a group of terrorists rob a store and they go off with uh, as much goods as they can carry. They're on their way back home in Mozambique and um, they're going to take something with them. So let's say they got a whole lot of crates of um, uh, family-sized cool drinks. That's what we used to call them. I think today they refer to them as two-liter drinks. Um, but at any rate, they've got, say, shall we say, three crates of these. They pile them on top of each other. There's five of them in the group. And so they set off. And, and, and it's heavy carrying it. So after a couple of days, they decide they're going to they're gonna get some help from a village. So uh, they stop outside one evening. They've been watching the, the place all afternoon. They're happy that there are no security forces anywhere in the vicinity. And so at night, uh, two of the members of this uh, group go into the village. And uh, they have, uh, through their observations, determined uh, which hut belongs to the headman. So they uh, rouse him up uh, from his bed and they say to him, uh, Listen, Father, uh, we'd like you to prepare some food for us. Uh, we are the boys from the bush. And um, uh, I think that uh, five plates of food would be uh, very gratefully received. So, uh, and we'll have a, a huku, a chicken with that as well. So the headman will, <clears throat> you know, go to five of the huts and say, I'm sorry to disturb you, but each of you must prepare a plate of food for the Bakomana. And these two guys will sit there and wait until the food is prepared. And they will then um, choose one of the, the stronger looking guys in the group there, or maybe even two of them, to accompany them. And uh, these men would be now conscripted, if you like, into the Guk army. And so they would go off to where the, the other companions were waiting hungrily for their food. They would um, sit down, um, enjoy the meal, and then they'd tell their, their captives, right, uh, pick up the, <laughs> the cool drinks and let's go. And, the, and they'd set off. And let's suppose that um, their leader is elected to go along a, a footpath for some distance because it just conveniently happens to be going in the direction he wants to take and it is night time and the moon is up and it just makes it so much easier for them to move quickly all right so that's the background to the story <clears throat> now because two men have been taken out of the village the uh, the, the inhabitants of that that place are, are quite alarmed now understandably and so as soon as the sun comes up or maybe even before uh, one of them sets off on a bicycle and he goes off to perhaps the nearest police station or the district commissioner's office and he frantically reports the fact that two people have been um, abducted. So uh, this f message filters its way through the system and eventually it ends up with your uh, platoon commander who summons you. Uh, you're ready to go like a Spitfire pilot. All your kit is in order. Your guys are standing by. Jump on the back of a 4-5 truck and uh, you get conveyed as close as you possibly can to this village. If it was a more serious incident, uh, a chopper would come and fetch you. So you arrive there. Now, most of the time you'll find uh, it's just the inhabitants of the village who are there, uh, are quite alarmed and they, they're expecting you to do big things and to go and bring back their family members. But sometimes, depending on the seriousness of the, the incident, I mean, there may have been a bit of argy-bargy there going on during the night. They may have killed somebody. They, you know, these things, <clears throat> they sometimes do this. Eh? They go into a village, they have a meeting, they call everybody together, and they'll just, um, you know, uh, uh, torture folk and kill them on the um, pretense that these men are sellouts. Um, and, and it's just to demonstrate their power uh, over uh, un, you know, unharmed, uh, unarmed civilians. And uh, in this way, you know, when we call them terrorists, it's a very apt name. It exactly describes their tactics and their methods. They try and control the population through terror. So something like that may have happened. And, um, and now you find the cops may have preceded you there. So the police are there, there may be other people, you don't know who they are sometimes. Um, and everybody's quite anxious for you to, to get out on the spur and do your job. But um, 
you, you can't just go barging off like that. You, you need some information, and this is the best place to get it. So you listen to everything that everybody's got to say. In the meantime, you've got your trackers doing 360 around the, the village, finding the, the exit point where these guys had fed and where they had left. They, while they're busy doing that, you're busy doing some interrogation of your own. Listen to what the cops have got to say. Listen to what military intelligence or whatever else happens to be there. But it's all subject to confirmation. <clears throat> you take it all, as it were, with a bag of salt. Thank the people for it. You speak to the headman. And now you try and find out a few things of your own. Clearly you want to know. Does he know how many people there were? He's only seen two. Okay, how many plates of food? Five. Okay, that gives us some indication. Did they say where they were coming from? No. Did they say where they were going? No, they didn't say anything. What language did they speak? Oh, they spoke um, Chisuzuru. Ah, oh, okay. Well, that, that tells you something now. Now you can start working out from uh, the language, what the, you know, what the political affiliation is. Gives you some idea of what you're up against. Uh, if they spoke, say, Sindabeli, uh, you know that the chances are good you're going to come up against a, a Zipra call sign. And um, they're a little bit more challenging to meet in the bush than the, the Zanla fighters. So you, you've got a little bit of information there. Uh, and you might ask him, do you see any weapons? No, he didn't see any weapons. But that's okay. You'll be looking there where they've rested and check on the ground for some butt prints may be able to discern something there that will give you some idea of the firepower that your, your quarry has. And so with this kind of basic information, what time, Madala, did they leave here? Oh, they left about 11. Okay, yeah, you look at your own watch and you start figuring out how far behind you are. And uh, with that done, you are now ready to, to get onto the, the spoor itself. But you have to set off knowing that you have to expect the unexpected. Anything can happen. Any, anything can happen on a follow-up. You don't know from one moment to the next what is actually uh, waiting for you. So um, you've got your information. Uh, you're at the right spot. You've got a good understanding of, of what has taken place around there. And uh, you know where the trail is, and, and now you're going to set off after it. Tracking formations. Well, we are quite fortunate in the example that I've just given of two men being abducted from this imaginary village. Uh, because in the first instance, it means that the information we have been given there is probably uh, correct. Uh, after all, these people want these men back, and they're not going to do anything to mislead us and hamper us. Uh, in our quest to find these gooks. Uh, secondly, it also means that the villagers themselves would not have engaged in any sort of uh, attempt to um, obliterate the track by driving livestock over it or, or, or other measures to try and uh, throw us off the trail. And thirdly, there's this um, vague possibility that the inclusion of these two captives in the group of tours will somehow uh, slow the pursuit down enabling us to make contact that much quicker. So um, here we are now. We're outside the village. We're standing on the side of this track, this footpath, and we can see this boy in front of us. Now, what do we do now? Let me just say, according to the textbook, uh, we would form ourselves up in this way. Uh, it would be a Y formation with uh, two trackers in front, uh, serving as the flanks, uh, one on the left, one on the right. In the center would be the, the tracker, the current tracker, who would be uh, looking at the spur and following it. And uh, behind him would be the tracker controller. And the tracker controller, of course, is the man who is the link uh, between the trackers and the soldiers following up behind. You see, this is the whole theory of the, the setup that the, the trackers bring the soldiers up to the enemy 
and the soldiers engage the insurgents uh, and, and the whole thing works in that way. Now, it, it's very cleverly thought out and a lot of experimentation and research uh, has gone into that um, type of formation. For instance, as the follower proceeds, um, let's say the spur veers off to the right. You would now have a situation where the right-hand tracker, the man on the flank there, finds a spur across his path, and he will signal that. And um, the man who is doing the tracker in the, the tracking in the centre will see the spur going off to the right. He then moves off to his right, past the right-hand flank man, and now he takes up the position on the right of that man as the flanker. So your previous right-hand man now becomes the tracker. The left-hand man holds position. He just moves around, uh, but he stays uh, doing what he did. And so uh, the follow-up swings off and goes off in the direction that the spur is leading them. And I dare say uh, that under the right conditions, the whole uh, matter works very well. However, in the context of 5RR, uh, let me just say, uh, the idea of having three trackers in a call sign, untold luxury. It never happened in my experience. Um, two trackers in the call sign, and they would be civilians, they would be either Changans, or they would be members of National Parks and Wildlife who would be doing time with the Army. And then there'd be the tracker controller myself, and then in support would be an MAG gunner who would be close to me. And as for soldiers following up behind, uh, that I'm now going to bring uh, toward the enemy. <laughs> well, I can't say it never happened. There were times when there were other call signs with me, but there were a great many times there would just be the four of us. Two trackers, myself, MAG gunner, Get out there, the kill rate is 10 to 1. If you find a, a bunch of gooks numbering more than 40, radio back. Otherwise, get on with it. <laughs> and you're on a charge if you come back tonight and you haven't killed anybody. Uh, of course, I'm pulling your leg, but it was that kind of sentiment. So, uh, here we are now, okay? We're on the, the side of the footpath. <clears throat> I've got two trackers with me. Here's myself, my MAG gunner. And now we're going to start the follow-up. Tracking. Well, here we are. We're standing beside the, the footpath. And we're ready to get going. We don't want to waste any more time. But uh, perhaps what we want to do is just uh, very quickly uh, confirm the numbers in the party that we're following. We strongly suspect that the gooks themselves, number five, that's how many plates of food were prepared. And we know that two men were taken out of the village uh, into the night. And... Um, so that brings the party up to up to seven. So does the spur tell us this? Now, according to the textbook, what you do is you take your R1, uh, lay it down beside the footpath, carefully I might add, on the grass, and take a stick, and then where the end of the butt is, draw a line across the footpath. Okay, now go to the the muzzle end of the weapon and do the same thing draw a line right across the footpath and pick up the weapon carefully now <clears throat> look at what you got between these two lines there are a number of footprints count the heels one two three four you ought to get to seven that's a little bit difficult up to five you, you're fine Beyond five, if they start becoming too many, there are formulas that trackers use. I won't go into that now. Just to help them uh, get a, a better estimate of the number of people that they are following. But let's say today we got nice, we got seven clear uh, heel prints. Two of them are barefoot. We know those are the guys from the village. And uh, let's look at the other tracks. Uh, we need to try and memorize them if we can. <clears throat> now, there are a number of very familiar shoe patterns uh, in Rhodesia. The North Stars, the Super Pros, the Feltskuns, the Army Boots, 
the Mars boots you could buy, say at the Farmer's Co-op, and a variety of others. And most of these patterns are, you know, it's the kind of thing you'd see uh, quite often uh, in the bush. They're made by local people or they're made by troops. Uh, but then there are other patterns which are uh, which look foreign and are foreign. Uh, you won't see them in any shoe shops in uh, in Rhodesia, and uh, quite prominent amongst these is one that we call a herringbone. Well, that's communist in origin. It even looks communist when you see it. It just looks like it doesn't belong on the land. Uh, so there's the herringbone. Then there's a a what we call a whiskey. Now there were some civilian. Uh, whiskey type patterns um, but that was a, it was a fine whiskey but what the gooks had was a was a was a coarse whiskey a wavy pattern and then there was another pattern quite uh, well known which I never came across which was referred to as the Cuban heel so you know when you look at the tracks you can get some kind of idea uh, you know of the footwear who are these people is, are there locals amongst them or not? In this case, let's say that we find a spur of a shoe made from a motor car tire. These were quite common in Rhodesia. And um, a guy would just take a motor car tire and cut it up and, um, you know, make it like a sandal. And boy, they outlast anything you can buy anywhere. They go for years, as you can well imagine. And you would very often come across something like that. So let's say we got one of those as well. Gook somewhere, his boots have fallen to pieces and he's acquired these while he's been in the country. So we've got the variety of tracks over there. And what I would do now is I would choose, say, a couple of the more prominent prints and, um, and memorize them. Um, but not just the the way that the the foot looks, but the stride of the individual who made that footprint. Um, so as we are walking, I can see. Okay, here's Mr. Herringbone. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow him. Uh, I see where he's put his footprint, and I see where the next one is, and I try and judge where the one will be after that. And so I'm kind of predicting where he's gonna be walking. He's right at the back of this pack, incidentally, so that's nice. There's nobody tramping on, on, on his tracks. And um, so I don't look down yet at my feet. I, I look uh, ahead of myself, and, and now we start. We're now following the spoor. We don't walk on that spoor. We preserve it all the time. We, we keep it. We, man, we might lose... Uh, the trail at some point uh, we might have overreached and thought we knew what we were doing and we've just gone a little bit further in the hope of recovering it and eventually uh, we've seen no we, we're completely in the wrong direction uh, and so we backtrack and we come to where the last preserved spur is and then we start again from there so we don't want to destroy uh, the evidence on the ground so we keep right off that footpath the other thing is <clears throat> Let's um, let's continue with our little uh, pretense here. Uh, these men are going back to Mozambique. They robbed a store. They got some crates over there. We don't know that, um, but we know they're carrying something heavy because we saw the imprint of that square base at the place where they were feeding earlier on. And we can see that the local guys that they have uh, taken captive are carrying this weight between them. It's... Uh, it's something that they are sharing. One is carrying one side of it. The other one's carrying the other end of it. It's wider than the footpath. So some guys got to walk on the grass some of the time. They put it down every now and then often, every so often to change hands. And it, it's, it's starting to feel heavier and heavier. It's nice. It's, it's slowing them down. Okay, whatever it is. <clears throat> so... Um, we're now, we now following them and we're preserving the spoor, but we're doing something else. We are keeping the spoor between ourselves and the sun. Well, not the flankers. They, you know, they, they got to be out there watching the bush and everything and, and, 
and I'm watching the spoor here. I'm not only being the tracker controller, but I'm also tracking at, at that point. So um, it's early morning. Yeah, the sun's on the right hand side. Uh, the, the spoor is on my right hand side. And I'm kind of half squinting into the sun, but that's nice because what I'm doing is as I watch the footprints, the shadow from the sun is uh, is making them stand out. Uh, they contrast with the sandy surface of the footpath. So I, I, I'm not going to move over to the other side of the trail, not at all, because now the shadows will be hidden in the depressions caused in the footprints. Uh, do you follow what I'm saying? You know, th if you think about it a, a little bit, you, you'll, you'll, you'll see that it is, it's, it's quite an important thing to bear in mind. You can't always do it. I know that. <clears throat> the gooks go where they want to go and half the time you, you're just guessing where they're going. Okay. And the sun rises and sets according to its foreordained uh, uh, clock. And there's nothing you can do to alter that. So there are times when you're going to find yourself on sandy soil with the sun behind you and the shadows falling away and you can hardly see the imprints left uh, on the ground in front of you. Those kind of things happen. There's nothing you can do about it. Just do the best that you can. Um, and, and so we proceed. And um, every now and then, one of the Shangons will be casting his eye in my direction because he's just got grass in front of him and bush. Okay, he's walking along. He's not he's not tracking. He's just there uh, in case he needs to track. And so we don't talk. It's all silent stuff. So um, every now and then he'll look my way and I will go like this. And that means I've got spur. Um, if I lose the spoor for some reason, maybe the, the footpath peters out and we find ourselves on some uh, different kind of surface and I can't see so clearly and I'm not too sure whether I'm still on the, on the trail, uh, then I'll, I'll do this. I've lost spoor. Yeah? Fingers up. I've lost spoor. That way, I've got spoor. Picture <laughs> some sand. There, I'm making uh, marks in the sand. I've got spoor. <laughs> no sand, no surface. I've got no spoor. Okay, enough silent signals. Um, up to now, we've been following what we call ground spoor. But let's say the trail wanders off uh, onto a grassy stretch of the bush. And now we, we can't see the footprints anymore. But what we do see is the grass pushed down in the direction of travel. And this we call aerial spoor. <clears throat> yeah, I say that loosely. Okay, I know the purists will talk about aerial spoor and they'll define it perhaps in a different way and they'll include spiderwebs in the trees and all the rest of it. We're not going to go there. We're keeping this simple. Okay, so here we've got aerial spoor and it's easy to follow. You know, it's, it's so nice when you come across it because there it is th through the bush, almost like a silver path and, um, and, and you just go. You, you, you've got to be careful, though, if you happen to stumble across aerial spoor, um, just, you know, at random. It's not always easy to tell its age. It, it sometimes looks a lot fresher than it is. I mean, you see it and you think, wow, those guys were here an hour before me. But they may have been there almost days before you. It, 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 has, it has that quality about it. So be careful in judging the age of aerial spoor. Okay, so now we're on the aerial spoor and we're going. And I said earlier on, expect anything. Anything can happen on a follow-up. And here, with this follow-up, what happens? They suddenly go off in, uh, uh, at a tangent for no rhyme or reason. And they go bumbling into, shall we say, a thicket. And they thrash around a bit there. We can see by the marks they're going this way, that way. And then they turn around and somehow wander back in the direction of the, uh, the grassy stretch again. And, and they continue. Now, why on earth did something like that happen? And, and the reason, we would surmise, 
uh, if we were doing the follow-up, is that they were still moving in the dark at that point. So uh, the leader decided we're going to change direction. It's dark. Say the moon's gone now. That also gives us a bit of an indication of what time this may have happened. And uh, he sets off uh, through the bush, comes to this obstacle, tries to get around it, tries to get through it, eventually gives up and goes back heads for some open land again and then continues walking. So now we know, all right, we know what the time is. I look at my watch, it's still early morning. These guys um, were here at night. This gives us uh, some idea of what time this happened. And so we continue and then we find their first resting place. <clears throat> and there again, here is this box outline on the ground being put down and um, we see where they've sat. They don't appear to have been there very long. Um, no cigarette ends around that we can see, so nobody's been smoking. Maybe that might just tell us that this also happened at night. And, you know, you don't want to light up cigarettes at night. But uh, maybe the gooks are less disciplined than we are. But uh, they, anyway, there's no cigarettes. No, no sign of uh, food or anything like that being eaten. Um, and they get up and go, and we continue following them. And then later on, we find the first of the, shall we say, the real resting places. Ah, oh, this is now a different story. Um, we can find a couple of uh, empty cool drink bottles, and we didn't know they had anything like that with them. And uh, we can see there's one gentleman who's been sitting here against a tree. He's uh, smoked a cigarette. Uh, a bit of it's still lying over there. And uh, later on, he's had another one. So there's two. Oh, well, say 10, 15 minutes for each cigarette. And how long would the gap be in between? Well, it depends how long the boss man tells them they can rest there. But they may have been there as much as an hour. So probably not much more, I would think, knowing that, uh, you know, <laughs> they're suspecting that somebody's going to be on their trail. So uh, they've had a good rest now, and they pick up all their stuff and they, they clear off and we still behind them. Later on we find another resting place but this time the sun is up and it's been getting hot and we can see okay this man sat here obviously in the shade and they've gone okay but the shadow is here now so between this point and this point the sun has moved and that is gives us the indication of how much time has passed and how far we're actually behind them now. And we can see, well, we've made good time. We, we're catching up with them. Uh, and a little bit further on, what do we discover? The mystery as to what this weight is, because one of the local guys has had enough, uh, saw his chance, taken the gap, and uh, he's run away. And we can see that they've continued a little bit further, and then they've just dumped all the cool drinks. There the crates are, lying on the side of the trail. Uh, a couple of bottles still missing, uh, which they've taken with them, carrying them under their arms, I suppose. But uh, now they're in a little bit of a panic, and we can see they're, um, you know, they're shaking a leg now because they know when that man gets back to the village at some point, uh, probably today, um, you know, the alarm is going to be well and truly sounded if it hasn't been already, which of course it has. They don't know we're that far behind them. So th this is the thing with the, with the terrorists now. They're never sure how far you are behind. Yes, they can lay some sort of a anti-personnel mine. And um, if you are unobservant and you set this thing off, they will know where they laid it, and when they hear the explosion, they'll know how far uh, you are behind them. <clears throat> but one thing they do know, they may not know uh, when you will come, but they always know the direction that you'll be coming from. So you, this is something that you bear in mind all the time as you're doing the follow-up. You're watching the tracks because you're not just looking at the tracks in order to follow them, but you're hoping that the tracks will It'll reveal something. And if you see the spur start coming back on itself and they're ambushing their own tracks, you, uh, you know, you, you got to start thinking very carefully. 
uh, whether you want to continue the pursuit. Because you see, you have to slow down to such an extent to try and uh, make sure that you don't walk blindly into an ambush that uh, you're actually losing so much time that the whole thing becomes almost meaningless. Um, and also you want to try and establish the direction of flight. Uh, you know, want to confirm that all the time as you're walking. Is there some sort of objective that these guys are aiming for? You know, I can remember on one occasion, across the Rhodesian um, uh, Zambezi Valley, following a bunch of gooks. <clears throat> and eventually, I thought to myself, no man, this trail is just as straight as an arrow. And I took my compass out, and I walked with it for a while. 11 degrees. 11 degrees from north. And it went on hour after hour after hour. In fact, we slept on the spur that night. We picked up the spoor again the next morning, uh, continued 11 degrees, 11 degrees, and we abandoned it sometime after lunch because we were almost at the, the border of the country. Uh, it was a pity that we didn't have at that time helicopters available. They were very, very scarce, short supply, um, because they could have gone ahead and, uh, you know, stopped this group. So, um, but we, for our purposes, on the footpath there and on the grassy uh, stretches, we still want to try and establish some general direction because if we lose the spoor, then, you know, we, we'll head in that direction and, and, you know, hopefully we'll pick it up again. Um, if we do lose spoor, <clears throat> now the, the, the big thing is to stop immediately at that point. If everybody uh, tells you that they've got no spur, then uh, the trackers must do a 360, quite a big 360, all the way around, right back over our tracks, not just here in front of us. Do a 360. You've got to bear in mind, no human being can step off this planet. I, I, you know, it's very difficult. That sounds so logical and so sensible, but Believe me, when you've lost spoor and you're standing in the bush and you can't find it, you, 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 your mind thinks, how is it possible? How, how can these guys just vanish like that? Well, they haven't vanished. They're somewhere. you just got to find that spoor and persevere. And it's a lot easier said than done. And sometimes you've got to just, right, okay, guys, let's go back on our own tracks, back to where we lost that confirmed spoor. And now very carefully look at the situation. What has happened over here? Um, where have they gone to? So um, there are, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, while you're doing the follow-up. And if luck should so have it that you've closed up the distance, <clears throat> and as, uh, thankfully it happens many times, they become complacent, uh, they are also human beings, they become tired, there have been tracker call signs that have walked right into them while the whole lot have been flat on their back, fast asleep, without a sentry. Well, somebody was posted a sentry, but he fell asleep as well. Four of them were cold like that one day without even opening their eyes to wake up. They just died, as it were, in their sleep through carelessness. So, um, uh, yeah, more often what happens is that you're still proceeding with a follow-up and you're closing up so rapidly and you're not aware of it and then the next thing you come under fire. That is more often the sort of experience that I've had. Just They suddenly start opening up on you. And then you've got to, you know, <clears throat> uh, try and deal with it. Uh, it's, it's just seconds. I mean, nobody in the context of what I was doing these guys were coming into the country and leaving the country. It was a one big, wide, massive corridor that they were using. And um, they weren't there to, you know, to have a contest of strength with us. So it was just bang, 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 get us to, to slow down. And they bombshell and gone. And then when you walk through the, the contact area, you may have been fortunate enough to, to nail a few. Um... But one thing you will be definitely find is large skid marks all over. And th this is the sign of men in flight. It's very strange. You think, you know, you, you think in your mind if somebody is running, they'll run in a straight line. But they, they don't. They, they zigzag. And when they zig, 
they almost sliding around that corner and they they leave these skid marks and then they zag and so it, and so it goes and it's it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting trail to to look at we've brought it to shall we say a successful conclusion uh, just to provide a happy ending let's say that the last remaining local guy uh, we found him hiding safe unharmed and he walked back with us uh, to the village so I hope that has given you some sort of uh, idea of uh, the sort of things that uh, we did in 5RR when it came to, tra uh, to tracking. Anti-tracking. An astute enemy who suspects that he's being pursued will always try and do something to slow you down. And uh, this will be done in various ways. He may try anti-tracking. He may try leaving explosive devices on the trail uh, in the form of POMZs. Um, he may even lay an ambush. And uh, these are all possibilities that you have to bear in mind while you're doing the follow-up. Anti-tracking <coughs> is always <laughs> something that is uh, it's easy to say, but it's very hard to do effectively. Uh, for example, uh, a, a common tactic employed is to try and walk backwards. And um, I've even seen troopies do this when they cross a road. Everybody in the stick will turn around and walk over the road backwards. And supposedly this fools anybody into thinking when they find the tracks that uh, you're going in the opposite direction to the one you're really taking. I don't want to fool anybody. <clears throat> uh, they may think they can walk like Michael Jackson, but it's, it's not so. If you look very carefully at the track, it doesn't take long walking backwards before your heels start digging in. And you'll see debris from the track, little stones or sand or something, being kicked, as it were, backwards from the direction of walk. And that's a sure indication that this fellow is not going where, <laughs> where his footprints say he's going. So walking backwards doesn't fool a tracker one little bit. Uh, changing footwear also doesn't really help because uh, there's a combination of tracks on the, on the ground. And then you see that they stop and you see shuffle marks. And then you see, like miraculously, uh, uh, other footprints. <laughs> well, obviously what's happened is they've changed footwear. So that also is not as effective as, uh, as uh, your quarry would think that it is. Um, <clears throat> and then there is uh, the old trick of, of dragging branches or something behind you to, to cover the spur. Well, all that does is leave great big scratch marks for you to follow and actually makes it a lot easier. Um, and, and then there's the, the old perennial one of uh, people getting into streams and, uh, you know, the water covering any evidence of their, their passage. But fortunately in Zimbabwe, uh, streams and rivers are places you've got to be very careful with. Crocodiles lurk everywhere and the enemy know it so uh, I have not really in my experience uh, come across I think not even one instance where I've followed tracks that led into a stream and then disappeared and we weren't able to find them again I do remember on one occasion we followed tracks uh, to the Musangezi River and uh, we could actually see the tracks on the far bank uh, where they had emerged from the water so they hadn't gone into the water to try and conceal their, their movements. They'd, they had to. They had to get across. Oh, no, I, I won't forget that particular day because, you know, the water came right up uh, to our waists. And, uh, you know, you are very, very conscious of the fact that you don't know what's lurking beneath the, the surface. And uh, a crocodile is a very formidable opponent. So... Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that wasn't something that we had to deal with often. Um, our enemy trying to, to hide in streams and in pools and things. And sometimes, of course, they would bomb shelf. They would just you know, get it into their heads that uh, somebody is pursuing them and they're close behind. Uh, and so they just all disappear into different directions. And it, it does make it a little bit difficult because, you know, you <laughs> You can follow one or a tiny little group, but when they've all gone to every point of the compass, uh, it is a little bit of a problem. Um, they can go so far as to um, 
uh, lay anti-personnel mines. Uh, Pom Z was a favorite of theirs. And, uh, you know, you've got to be sharp and you've got to be, you know, have your eyes open to try and detect these things. And if, if you miss it, the consequences are, are dire. Um, and then sometimes, of course, too, they'll backtrack on their own tracks and, um, and ambush you. They have one advantage, okay? They, they may not know exactly when you're coming, but they, they always know the direction that you'll be coming from. So, you know, they can position their men and they can lay a nice ambush uh, if they want to. They, you know, these are the sort of things they do to delay you. And of course, the, the big advantage for them when they do lay anti-personnel devices is that when they hear the explosion and they know where they've put that, uh, they can work out how far behind you are. Well, it'll slow you down, but, um, you know, it, it certainly helps them. Um, but I would say that the the best um, thing that I ever saw the enemy do uh, to avoid uh, capture was um, uh, one morning on the edge of the Zambezi Valley up on the escarpment. Now, somebody during the night had seen a fire burning down on, on the valley floor and they had taken a, a rough bearing on this um, but by the time the sun came up there was no smoke and the distance was too great they they couldn't see anything but because we were at a bit of a loose end the platoon commander said to me take your guys take a pair of binos with you and just see if you can see something from the high ground there but uh, none of us expected to really find anything, but it was, you know, we had to go through the motions of doing that. So we were walking along uh, toward uh, quite a bit of high ground, uh, intending to do just what we've been told to do, when we cut across some spoor. And we, we stop and we're quite surprised um, because we, you know, we're high above the valley floor. This has got nothing to do with any fire down below. So um, uh, we, we turn left and we start following the spur. I send back a, re a report that we're on tracks. And uh, we walk for a, for a while. <clears throat> but I can see that whoever we're following is making no effort uh, to conceal his, uh, his trail. And then the, the gooks take a sharp right turn and they start moving down the escarpment. And they're doing this along an old watercourse, great big boulders, and they're sort of stepping between them or hopping from one to the other. And uh, we're following suit wherever we can find a bit of uh, tracking sign, uh, some disturbance that shows us we're still doing the right thing. And um, it, it's hard work and it's hot. It's a blistering hot day. We eventually get right down onto the valley floor and I heave a sigh of, sigh of relief because I know now we're going to start following up um, on, on more or less level ground and it's probably going to head straight for the uh, Mozambique border. But to my surprise uh, we find that the tracks swing left again and they go for just a short distance along the base of the escarpment and then left again and I immediately stopped the follow-up and I had a conference with the trackers. I said, guys, this can't be. We've just come down the escarpment. We've gone maybe a couple of hundred yards. And now we're going to, it looks like they're going to climb up the escarpment again. And they said, yes, sir, that's, that's what we see here too. I thought, this just doesn't make sense. This is, this is crazy. And we start ascending the escarpment again. But this time they have chosen surely the steepest place there for miles around we're almost uh, hanging on uh, by our fingertips um, scaling the heights trying to get to the top halfway up I'm finished I tell you I, 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 I take my pulse and it's something like about it's, it's, it's varying between 160 and 180 and it's probably done that for the last hour or two I am worn out I've had it and the guys are in the same position some of them are almost dragging their weapons behind them. I myself am using my R1 as a crutch. And it's the kind of thing that I really don't do. I, I, you know, I don't like to support myself with a weapon. The weapon must be in my hands. There's no ways, not that day. I'm using it to try and help me to get to the top of the, of the escarpment. When we get there, we are finished. We've absolutely had it. I'm standing there 
panting, I'm drenched in perspiration, and uh, the tracks continue, this time in a southerly direction, away from the escarpment. And uh, we come to the, end, the edge of a milli field, and I was so tired then, I said, boy, uh, one of the guys made a comment, he said, if they want the country now, they can have it. And I thought, boy, if this is what it takes to, to keep Rhodesia free, we're hard pressed indeed. I don't know how this, man, how this man got his men to go down that escarpment and up again, especially the places that he chose. He must have had a togger off in his hand all the time and was threatening to shoot them. And uh, we just collapsed in whatever shade we could find under those millies. And uh, I lay there in a, in a furrow between two rows of, of, of maize plants try to catch my breath and uh, I mean when we recovered you know we just walked to the nearest road where we could find and uh, and called for somebody to come fetch us and only later when I was you know in a sort of better physical condition and my mind was working better I thought man you know <clears throat> you must have been so close behind these guys so so close um, because they couldn't have done that at night, so they must have done it during the day. Probably when you were going down the escarpment, they were going up. And uh, if if we had just that little bit more uh, physical endurance and just continued on the spur, we may well have stumbled across them resting up somewhere. So that was the best tactic I ever saw. If you're being pursued and you're fit, don't worry about covering your signs. Just outdistance yourself uh, on on sheer physical energy. Um, put the distance between yourself and your pursuers. If you can tire them out, I think, in my opinion, uh, that's the best way of getting away from uh, from people following you. Self development. We might well be living in the twenty first century, but there are still times when the ability to track. It can be a very useful skill indeed. I was driving home one Friday afternoon along what we refer to here as the N2 highway. I stopped at a set of traffic lights and I was sitting there uh, rather absent-mindedly waiting for the lights to change. And in front of me a bit of a drama unfolded. Uh, there was an SUV with a lady driver and uh, she was sitting there too uh, waiting for the light to go green when a gentleman and I say I say this rather reservedly. Uh, a gentleman appeared over there next to her, uh, tapped on the window, and indicated that he was hungry and did she have some some money for him. Well, it's a, a common enough scene around here, and one doesn't pay all that much attention to it, I suppose. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw a companion of his um, sidled up to the passenger side window. And while she was distracted dealing with this man who was asking for money, his companion smashed the window, reached in, grabbed her handbag, pulled it out and uh, disappeared through the traffic down an embankment uh, and was gone. Now all this happens in, in seconds. It happened so fast I didn't even see how she got injured, but she was also injured in this attack. The man who distracted her, the beggar, he just uh, disappeared as if by magic in between the cars and he was gone. Well, I leapt out of the vehicle that I was in, um, shot down the embankment uh, to find myself in a, in a, in a lot of um, Port Jackson uh, undergrowth. Uh, very thick, but the, the ground was very soft and I could see the footprints of this uh, criminal. So I set off after him. Um, and it was clear that as he was running, he was emptying the handbag. Um, throwing out what he didn't need because I was I was coming across shopping lists and you know all sorts of other documents and things I didn't stop to look at them I mean I was hot on this man's trail and then eventually I found the empty handbag and when I, I found that I knew that um, you know there was no point in me pers uh, pursuing him any further uh, not too far in the distance was a very densely populated um, suburb and I knew that uh, he was probably in amongst those houses by now. So I picked up the handbag, uh, walked back along the trail, uh, retrieved whatever I could, and by the time I had climbed out of this embankment back onto the road again, uh, the cops had arrived. And they stood there, and I don't mean this in a bad way at all, they stood there rather helpless, 
they were comforting this lady, um, which was good of them. Um, but I thought to myself, hey, uh, you are the guys with the firearms. You are the guys with the authority. Why aren't you down there on the spur? I mean, instead of standing here, you could have maybe come and given me a hand. You could have overtaken me and caught this bloke. But I didn't say that, but it was the kind of thing that went through my mind. I don't blame them. They're not, they're not trained to do that sort of thing. And I, I wonder to myself how many police forces around the globe uh, have the ability to, you know, to pursue uh, criminals in that fashion. Probably not many. <clears throat> yes, if you uh, are interested in tracking, then, you know, I would say to you, please pursue this interest. Read up what you can. Study what you can. You've made a good start listening to this video. I mean, uh, basic as it is and, and introductory as it is uh, but build on that um, and the best way is um, go outside track yourself um, walk over different terrain come back and see if you can find your own spur um, do it with varying time intervals get some of your buddies to to play along with you if you like and uh, so as you practice 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 you'll get better and better at it it's um, it, it's a wonderful subject really and um, I would encourage you I really would if you are interested uh, go ahead and uh, do what you can to improve your skills as a tracker yes yeah, something to bear in mind in theory theory and practice are the same in practice uh, they are not well, I hope that short introduction to tracking was of some interest to you. Uh, you will have noticed some uh, rather charming uh, illustrations depicting girls in uniform <laughs> who served during the Bush War. So, uh, ladies, as a, as a little bit of a tribute to you, uh, a word of thanks from all us guys. Um, have a very happy Valentine's Day. And uh, to Marianne, who supplied the illustrations, Thank you very much for your kindness. Uh, folk, uh, do visit him on uh, DeviantArt. You'll see more examples of his work there. Uh, a really wonderful artist. So thank you very much for that. Well, I think I've spoken enough now for today. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that. And uh, wish you all well. Uh, take care. Look after yourselves uh, until we uh, get together again. Uh, cheers for now.